So Romans, I don't know about you guys, but I'm loving this series. I love the book of Romans. Uh, and I think we're, we're, we're going to be brushing over this so quickly. Um, and as, as Jeremy said the other week, I was arguing with him because I wanted to do it for the rest of the year. And he gave us seven weeks, and so he set us quite a challenge, but I still think we should be going for the rest of the year. But uh, I'll, I'll concede defeat there. But uh, so, so far we've looked at Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, 3 and 4. In chapter 1, Paul really laid the foundation for what was ahead. And he has his thesis statement in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, where he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is essentially what Paul then seeks to explain throughout the rest of the book. And we saw in chapter, the end of chapter 1, it quickly takes a turn where he starts pointing out our problems. Firstly, the problems and issues of Gentiles and then the issues of Jews. And when we see that the climax of that point that Paul makes is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then last week, Jeremy got the pivot point in the book where we start hearing the good news, righteousness by faith, that despite the fact that all of us have fallen short of loving like God loves, God has made a way for us to be reconciled to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to continue looking at how righteousness by faith benefits us. We're going to be looking essentially at the impact of story. Now, whether you realise it or not, each and every one of us is living according to a story. A story was massive in the minds of, of the Jewish people and the story of Israel, they saw themselves as those who were liberated from captivity and they were waiting for God to once again in the first century liberate them from Roman oppression. And so the Exodus story was this, this grand narrative that informed them about who they were and where they were going. And so Paul is going to grab a hold of the Exodus narrative in chapter 6 when he talks about baptism. Now, I find it pretty amazing that we get to do a sermon on baptism from Romans chapter 6 when Steve's getting baptised. It wasn't planned. I'm not clever enough to plan that. But I think it's pretty neat nonetheless. So we're going to be looking at the, the Exodus story and, and how that ties in with baptism as a story. But, but when we think about story, the, the narrative that we have has a huge impact on us. It impacts our, our self-identity, who we see ourselves to be, and that, that shapes our values and our beliefs. It impacts our self-esteem, how, how valuable we see ourselves are in relation to others. Story even impacts our motivation levels, whether we feel like living in a certain way or not. It impacts our resilience, so pushing through the challenges of life. It impacts our behaviour, our emotional well-being, and our relationships. The story we tell ourselves, the story we live out, impacts our lives. And so, as we're sharing today, I want you to be thinking about your story. What's your story? We've heard part of Steve's story and where God's story intersected with Steve's and now Steve is on a different trajectory. He has a new story. But what I want you guys to be thinking about the story you're telling yourself because whether you realise it or not, that story is impacting you either for good or for bad. And we're going to see that God is offering each and every one of us a new story. So if you've got your Bibles there, we're going to jump into the Romans chapter 5. Before that though, just, just looking at this idea of story as, as the, the Jews saw in terms of the Exodus. There's a verse in Jeremiah chapter 23 where Jeremiah makes this point that at this point in time, the story they told themselves was about the exodus, that God liberated them from captivity to Pharaoh. And you see this in the commandments as well. When, when we look at the, the commandments in Exodus chapter 20, the, the description is that God had freed them from, from, from Pharaoh, from, from slavery, therefore they were called to live in a certain way. They didn't have to live in a certain way to be free. 
They could live in a certain way because they were free. And this was the story that they were telling themselves. This was their narrative. But in Jeremiah, he tells us that there would be a new story coming. 23 verse 7, it says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, As the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up the, and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, then he shall dwell in their own land. Jeremiah is saying here that there's going to be a new story in the future. He's pointing forward to Christ, that there'll be a point in time where no longer would they talk about how God liberated them from slavery to Egypt, but how God liberated them from slavery to sin. And this is what Paul's going to be talking about in Romans. So let's go to Romans chapter 5. We're going to be moving through pretty quickly, and we'll just try to draw out some of the key points. Romans chapter 5. Paul says, Therefore, therefore means he's referencing everything that he's already said. So because of what he's already established, which last week was righteousness by faith. We have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our own sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, there's a a lot in that. But what Paul is saying is that because of the objective fact of the gospel, we now have this subjective and personal experience. But the key idea that I see jumping out is this idea of peace, having peace. And, and when you think about the chaos of our world, who doesn't want peace? That inner peace. But peace is not this idea of living in a place where there's not turmoil. Peace is the idea of despite being in a, in a chaotic location, you're at peace within. And the peace that God is offering us in terms of the context of this word is peace that comes at the end of war. We have peace with God. We are no longer at war with him. Christian peace rests on the objective fact, not subjective feelings. It rests on the objective fact of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. So as a Christian, when I'm seeking peace, it's not looking for an environment or a circumstance where I go, finally, some peace. It's looking to the objective fact, the history of Jesus Christ on the cross and saying, because of that, I have peace with God. I am no longer disconnected. I'm no longer at war with him. I have been reconciled. I've been reconnected. Christian Christian peace rests on that objective fact. I love that Paul also talks about hope. Our hope is to the human spirit what oxygen is to the lungs. If you don't have oxygen, you've got three and a half minutes and then you're done. If you don't have hope, how long do you have? Hope is to our human spirit what oxygen is to our lungs. Paul is saying the hope of the glory to come of us being reunited in person with God will not put us to shame. And what he's saying there is that sometimes we have the hope of something coming ahead and plans fall through. It doesn't come to be. And one of the commentators I was reading, he he talked about as a kid, he was an American, and his parents had told him, you're going to Disneyland this year. And so he had the hope of a holiday to Disneyland. And so as a kid, you can imagine the excitement that he had. And he's telling all his friends, guess what? going to Disneyland. And all year he's bragging about this. But then his dad lost his job. Their circumstance changed and they could no longer make this trip. And so the the, the kid has this this shame associated with saying, well, it's not actually happening anymore. But the hope that we have in God will not put us to shame. We don't have to fear this not coming to fruition. This is a hope that doesn't disappoint. We're going to transition to verse 6 through to 11. 
this is, this is the objective fact that we're standing on here. It says, for why we will still weak, another translation might say powerless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. At the right time, that's, that's a reference to Daniel, the prophecy of when the Messiah would come. That's something to study. If you haven't looked that up, do yourself a favour. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person would dare him die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God to come. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now Paul's writing is dense. There is so much in this. We could spend our whole time sitting in these first 10 verses. Let's just draw out a few key points. Paul is saying that while we were weak, while we were powerless, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners, while we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. Now, if God was willing to do that for us while we were his enemies, now that we've been reconciled, how much more is he prepared to do stuff for his children? Much, much more. We have no reason to doubt God's goodness anymore because the righteousness of God, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God has been revealed in Jesus Christ on the cross. Therefore, we don't have to doubt, we don't have to fear being put to shame. And this was not done for us because we earned it, but it was done because of the goodness of God. This is profound. Meditate on this idea and it'll change your life. Now, it talks about this idea of being justified. This is a declaration of being righteous, declaration of being right with God. It's not being made right. Paul is going to get to that in later chapters, but this is initially the declaration that you are justified. This verse 10 is the answer that we've needed to hear since chapter 2, where Paul is talking about the judgment to come, that we are going to be judged based on what we're doing. And so you can imagine the audience that's listening to that, waiting for this answer to say... We are justified. That's a courtroom term. We are going to be justified. We are going to be saved. We don't need to fear the future judgment because of what has already happened in the past. This is good news. There's this statement here that really encapsulates what God has done for us, what Christ has done for us. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, he was judged for our sins, in which we had no share, oh sorry, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. Amen Amen indeed. It's a profound idea. I think this statement really, really does a good job of articulating the whole gospel message. What wondrous love it is that Christ allowed himself to be treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. How profound it is that we are reconciled. Paul goes on later talking about this free gift. Five times in chapter five, he talks about the free gift. It's a gift that can't be earned. But it's going to lead to a transformation, as is evident in Steve's life. It leads to good things. It leads to loving like God. But what wondrous love God has bestowed on us. We need to get to the root of the sin problem, though. Because we've seen in chapter 2 and and 3 that there's something wrong within the heart of humanity. And and we've seen in chapter 4 and 5 
that the solution to it is not behavioural reform externally. While it leads to a change in behaviour, that is not how you bring about the change of the core. So what's the root of the problem? Paul shares in chapter 5, 12, he says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. The root of the problem is not our behaviour. The root of the problem is our patriarch, our grandfather, Adam. And we have inherited brokenness from him. Paul is saying in verse 12 that because of Adam, we have inherited this brokenness. And so no amount of behavioural form is going to change the core of who I am. This is, this is a highly dense passage from verse 12 through the end of chapter 5. And we're not going to be able to explore all of it here. But there's two summarising verses. There's verse 12 and then verse 18. It says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Sin came into the world through one man, Adam. Life comes into the world through another man, Jesus, or the second Adam. And so we've got to get to the root of this problem, which is our grandparent. We're going to compare the pair. We're not comparing super. We're comparing our patriarchs. When you look through this pa passage, you get a list of different attributes that, that are given to each individual. So we've got Adam. And as we read through this list, the first man, there's sin, there's death, there's transgression, there's condemnation, there's judgment, disobedience, and sinners. This is not a positive list. But when we compare it to the second Adam, the last Adam, compare it to Christ, we have the free gift. We have grace. We have righteousness. We have justification, that the declaration of being right with God. We have life. We have obedience. And lastly, eternal life. Which list do you want to be in? By, by default, through no fault of our own, just by being born, you are underneath Adam 1. Every single human ever, except for Jesus Christ, who was not born in the lineage of Adam, but was the son of God, born to a virgin. But if you are not in that circumstance, which is all of us, then this is what you inherit. Sin, death, transgression, condemnation, judgment, disobedience, you're a sinner. So we sin because we're in a state of sin, capital. But what God is offering us in the free gift is rebirth. Paul starts talking about this in chapter 6. He's offering us to become descendants of a new lineage of humanity, humanity 2.0, which he launched in Jesus Christ. And in this second person, we get grace and righteousness and justification and life and obedience, eternal life. In this second person, we can finally live as we're called and designed to live as humans, reflecting the character of God to those around us. In Romans 13.10, Paul says the fulfilment, the law is love. Like love is the fulfilment of the law. And so someone who's acting in obedience will be loving like God loves. This is what God wants his people to be living like. But then we can ask the question, how do we become a descendant of Christ? How do we move away from the lineage of the first Adam and into the new humanity? What does that look like? And Paul says faith. The just shall live by faith. And we see in Romans chapter 3, verse, I believe it's 21, no, 22, the righteousness of God through the faith, yours might say, in Jesus Christ. Depending on a translation, some will say the righteousness, the faith of Jesus Christ. And it's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ that allows us to have faith in Jesus Christ, which then saves us. He was faithful so that we can be faithful. So it's faith that gives us access to this new lineage. But how would I demonstrate this faith? What does that look like? Before getting to that, what we see is that the disgrace of Adam is trumped by the grace of Christ. 
Jesus' grace far exceeds Adam's disgrace. And we look at that list and you go, how horrendous is that? You look at the state of the world. The reign of sin is outmatched by the reign of grace. And so hope will not put us to shame. We get to chapter 6 and we've asked this question, okay, so how do I transition myself in to the new Adam? Let's read verse 1, 6, 1. What shall we say then? Are we con- to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Now Paul is preempting some questions that might come up in relation to his theology. There's two major issues that he's trying to address here. One problem is that you would come to the conclusion because of grace... It no longer matters how I live. We could call this um, antinomialism, or it's like cheap grace, going, the law doesn't matter anymore, obedience doesn't matter. And this is clearly something that Paul's not emphasising. In verse 1, he talks to you about the importance of obedience. And in chapter 6, once again, in verse 18, was one example where we become free from sin, but slaves of righteousness, loving like God loves. Obedience and faith are intertwined. But as I said at the start, the, the Jews became obedient to God. Well, this was their desire, not to be saved, but because they were saved. Matthew one twenty one says, Jesus came to save his people from their sins, not in their sins. So Paul is trying to uh, avoid people coming to the conclusion that grace just covers us and you continue to do what you want. Grace is transformative not permissive, it's restorative, it changes us. The other concern that might be raised is that grace will lead to, I guess it's from the other perspective, the same concern but from the other side of the political spectrum where you could say there's individuals who were concerned that Paul's preaching was going to lead to licentiousness, going to lead to a life of rebellion. And so he's addressing both concerns in this statement. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? If we quickly just flip over to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Keep your finger in Romans though because we will go straight back there. Ephesians 2, 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and in sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air. Paul here is saying we were dead in sin once. But now we're dead to sin. And he makes this point in in 6, chapter 11, that we would consider ourselves dead to sin but alive to God. But let's read Romans chapter 6. And getting back to this idea of how we, by faith, move into the new lineage, move into the new humanity. Do you not know, verse 3, that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him in a death like this. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So we would no longer be enslaved to sin. There's that Exodus language, the idea of enslavement. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now we have died with Christ. We believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This baptism idea is essentially a reliving of the Exodus story. 1 Corinthians talks about that the children of Israel, when they passed through the Dead Sea, they were baptised unto Moses. They no longer are slaves in Egypt anymore. 
Pharaoh's army follows them into the water. Pharaoh's army did not emerge from the water, only the children of Israel. When we are baptised, sin follows us into the water, but it dies there and we emerge descendants of the new humanity. We are united in Christ's death. We are united in his resurrection and therefore we can walk in this newness of life. It's a symbol, but a powerful symbol nonetheless. It's an exodus experience, exiting out of this state of sin, out of this old Adam experience and into the new. Therefore, Paul says, how can we continue in sin when you have died to it? That doesn't make sense. And so we can calculate, we can look at the facts and figures and come to an an assessment, a realisation that that old life is gone and I can walk in newness of life, newness of spirit and I can now live and love like God has called me to love, empowered to live a new life. That's the power of baptism. That's why we're celebrating today because another child is coming home, another child is recognising who they are in Christ because Jesus has died for each and every one of us. This is a powerful message. And I can see, therefore, why, why Paul is saying, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? By no means. That's ridiculous. And this is not, Paul is not saying that you will not have a propensity to sin. That's not what he's saying, but he's saying you are no longer a slave to it. You're no longer in this state of Adam 1 over here. You now can walk in newness of life. You can look back at that old situation go, I'm dead to that. I'm living a new story now. To be a Christian is to live a new story according to Christ, according to what he has done. You are no longer your past anymore. You are no longer your actions. You're no longer what you have done or what people have done to you. You have a new story, a new identity, and with that comes self-esteem and motivation With that comes new beliefs and behaviours. With that comes a transformation of life. The gospel is powerful. And when someone is baptised, though the enemy may come and tempt them and attack them, they can look back to their experience and go, I am no longer a slave. I have been redeemed. I have been baptised. This is actually what Martin Luther would do. Martin Luther, the great reformer, when he was tempted by the enemy... He had this Latin saying, which I can't say, but essentially he would, he would cry out, I have been baptised, therefore you have no claim on me. I have been baptised, I am now Christ. And you see this language in chapter 6 where it's, it's with him, it's in Christ, it's with Christ. He died for us and this united language. So if we have been baptised, we can now claim as if it was our own death. And Romans 7 and 8 is going to look at the transformed life. Because the hardest thing for the Christian, I believe, after coming to God, is learning to live the newness of life. And Romans 7 and 8 is going to explore that further. But today, we're looking at this accomplished fact that we as Christians are those living according to a new story. A new story. And so when Steve is baptised this afternoon, when he's immersed in the water, that is his grave. He's no longer breathing, so in the mind of a Jew, he's dying to the old self, submerged below the water. But as he emerges, it's birth. It's a context of creation. Water and the Spirit. When Jesus was baptised, the Holy Spirit descends on him and says, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. And Steve gets the same experience this afternoon. The context of recreation where he emerges as a descendant of Jesus Christ, rather than the old Adam. And there will be challenges ahead, but he can look back to today and go, I have been baptised. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am no longer in Egypt anymore. Imagine if you had a landlord who was a real stickler and hassling you all the time, barging into your house and demanding that you pay rent in advance. Just a horrible individual ruining your life and you finally discover a new place that you can live. You get a new home, a new landlord. And imagine that you're living in this new location and you hear a bang at the door and you open the door and it's your old landlord demanding money, rent money. Do you have to pay the money anymore? No. 
It would be ridiculous of you to be paying that individual money. They don't have a claim on you anymore. You have a new landlord. Therefore, you have new loyalty. And so this is the same for us, that if we have been baptised, though we may feel tempted to obey the old Lord, because we've got old neural pathways in our mind, we're going through this experience of learning how to live as a free person, we don't have to obey that anymore. That old person is dead. Leave him there. Baptism may just be a symbol, but it's a powerful one nonetheless. And I think it would be remiss of me not to give the opportunity to anyone who would like to be baptised to make that decision. And so if, if you're yet to be baptised and God is stirring on your heart, if you're, you're hearing this story and going, I need a new start, I want to be living according to a new story, then it's an opportunity to respond. Find myself, find Jeremy, one of us, find anybody and say, this is something that I would like to do. If you're feeling courageous enough, you can put your hand up now and let me know and we can have a conversation over lunch. But this is something that is offered to each and every one of us, is a new story. We don't have to wait. We don't have to do it in our own strength. We can access what we have in Christ presently. And so I just want to encourage each and every one of us as we close now to remember who you are. To live according to this new story. Live according to who God declares you to be in Christ and not according to the old self which has been buried in baptism. Thank you.